Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. He told me you killed him. No. I am your father. Let's go. It's frame rate. Welcome to Frame Rate Episode 45. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, I'm Brian Brushwood. We're here. Uh, again, I met, metamorphosized. I juxtaposed. I used words improperly, but I'm here in studio. That teleporter stuff. Is Teleport. Just, that's what I did. Working really well. I like metamorphous juxtaposing. Also joining us today, CEO of Boxy, Mr. Avner Ronan. Thanks for taking the time to chat with us, Avner. Hey, guys. Good to have you along. Uh, in fact, that's going to uh, kick us off with our big story right off the top. This just in, the big story. Our big story today is we've got Avner Ronan. Yes. CEO of Boxy. <laughs> you are, the, and we're not saying you're particularly huge, I mean, in stature, but uh, but you're very important to us is what we're trying to say. Yeah, no, we, this is uh, something we hope to do from time to time is get uh, to talk with the folks who are actually making the ability to cut the cord happen. And the Boxy Box is one of those. I, I have one. Uh, it's a great way to put television, uh, internet television on your real television. You can also use Boxy on your uh, computer as well. Uh, Avner, great to have you along. First of all, uh, tell folks about Boxy. Tell them uh, what's new about it. And, and, and we got a lot of people in the chat room wanting to know when the next version is going to come out. So, you know, first, thanks for, uh, for having me over. And, you know, we started Boxy just about four years ago. And the idea was to make it really easy for people to watch whatever they want from the internet on their TV. So whether it was stuff that they're streaming or stuff that they already have in their local network and bring it all together in, you know, in an easy to use uh, interface with a simple remote. Um, and we released the Boxy Box together with D-Link about uh, just less than a year ago. It's available here in the US and in Canada and in a bunch of countries in, um, in Europe. And, you know, people that go out and, and buy it use it to watch movies and TV shows, but also a lot of, you know, original web content on their TVs. And they share it out to Facebook and Twitter. And we released an iPad app um, just a couple of months ago, so they can take some of those experiences also with them on the go. Um, and regarding the next version, we're working right now on a new software update for the box, um, which we're pretty excited about. We don't have... A firm date yet, but um, you know we have it already running here at um, at our offices, and it's probably going to be one of our most important updates since we released the box. What's coming in that update? So there's going to be some you know major UI changes that we believe users will like, and we're also going to introduce some uh, some new functionality that hopefully uh, would make Box even um, even better. Would uh, would channel updates be part of this, or is this just the the framework that makes it work? <laughs> so, you know, today when we look at users that, that use Boxy, um, most of the consumption, most of the time spent is, is movies and, and TV shows. Um, we're missing on a lot of content that is just not available over the top today. And I think that's a big thing that uh, our users would want to see, but not necessarily in our control. So whatever we can do to improve the experience in the meantime for the content that we do have and building the infrastructure to support whatever is, is coming is where we're uh, focused more than anything else. Do, do you have plans to update the, the computer version, the non-box version uh, anytime soon? Because I know that's on a little bit of a different schedule. 
Yeah, very, very different uh, schedule. It's been neglected by us for now over a year, actually, since we last updated. What happened is once we released the box, um, we became, you know, insanely focused on on getting that box to work better and and improve the feature set and resolve bugs for people that went out and spent 200 bucks on it and kind of um, left the software for PC and Mac behind. So we promised our users to release an updated version in the fall, um, which I guess the fall has started based on the weather I see here outside my window in New York. Yeah, we got a lot of rain today. That usually means fall out here. Yeah, so um, we're working on it. Um, the plan is still to release it um, this fall, but you know, to be honest with uh, with our users, and I mentioned it when I blogged about it too. You know, the PC and Mac uh, are probably never going to get the same priority for us as um, as the box moving forward. Um, and as a small company, we need to pick our battles and, and stay focused. And we chose to focus on on the box, um, where we think you know the future of the company is is going to depend on is on getting a great CE experience out there that people can pick up in a store or order from Amazon, just connect to the TV and work. And to, to those users who are building, you know, home theater PCs, um, we hope that they'll be happy with, uh, with our update, but um, probably our commitment level is not as strong as it used to be. Sure. I have to say, I really like the device. I mean, the uh, the, the remote especially is, is the most brilliant remote for a uh, home theater box that I've used. Well, and, and I remember the first time, I mean, to me, it was a magic trick. When I was over at your house and you handed me the remote, I'm like, well, how do you search for stuff? You're like, turn it over. And it blew my mind. Uh, have you seen any copycats on that remote style? I mean, I, I got to assume other people are going to try to rip off the idea, if not the exact design. Yeah, we actually saw... Uh a bunch of knockoffs and you know we the way we think about it internally you know we're not thinking about uh, patents we think that as long as we're the guys being copied rather than doing the copying we'll be fine right so we take it as a badge of honor uh, yeah, and I guess, uh, yeah, assuming there's people out there who aren't familiar with the actual boxy box remote, on one side it, you hold it, it, it feels like the Apple TV remote, very simple, up, down, left, right, uh, control button, and then you flip it over and it's a complete QWERTY keyboard right on the other side. Yeah, um, moving away, you know, getting you off the hot seat a little bit, talking just about the boxy itself, the, uh, the whole show here, Frame Rate, is about being able to watch the video you want to watch, when you want to watch it, where you want to watch it. What do you see as some of the things that need to be overcome to be able to make this a reality where I can just, you know, buy something like a boxy box, put it in, in my home theater and get all of the content I want? I mean, it seems like a licensing nightmare out there. Yeah, it's, you know, I think it's, got, it's gotten better since we started the company. The amount of content and the quality of the content is definitely better. You see companies like Netflix, um, investing real dollars, meaningful dollars in, in getting great content for their streaming service. And, you know, Hulu is doing a great job on that front. I think Amazon is now more committed than ever. Um, so I think the trend overall is, is positive. But, you know, there's some stuff out there that I think it's still going to take years to, to resolve. Well, and the I, would, uh, I would imagine that you have to fight multiple battles on different fronts because it's, it's very ambitious what you guys are doing. You, you've got hardware. It, Boxy is not only the Boxy Box hardware, it's also the platform. And I would assume uh, that eventually you want it to be ubiquitous so you could have, that you could be the gateway to get all of your content. But at the, uh, at the same time, to, to even get to that, you have to go through this unbelievable licensing nightmare, not only with the content providers, but, uh, but also, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I remember what, what a headache it was. I tried hacking my, uh, my Apple TV two years ago to put Boxy on there just so I could use Hulu. And then, of course, Hulu, uh, you know, threw a fit and, and pulled the plug on it. What is the number one challenge for you guys now moving forward to, to, to realize that dream of getting all the content you want, whenever you want it, however you want it, on whatever device you want? So I think the company has three main challenges. One is, um, is product, probably the most important, is where we need to continue and invest and make it simpler and make it better and um, make it easier for the user to, to find content and make it um, just an amazing experience for, for consumers. I think that's still the number one challenge and where we focus most of our attention. Um, the second challenge is content. 
even if we build the most amazing experience, but you can't watch the show you want to watch or the game you want to watch or the movie you want to watch, then all we've done was for nothing. And the third is probably just getting the word out, building our brand, building distribution, um, that I hope that if we can execute well on number one, that is fully in our control, benefit from the macro trends in the industry on number two, then number three kind of um, in many ways will take care of itself. But um, I, I think still number one challenge for us and where we still think there's a lot of room to innovate and to, uh, to create values on the product side. And content, you know, we were patient and we believe that at the end, um, you know, putting barriers around content based on a distribution platform is, is arbitrary and that um, users are already um, voting with their remotes and with their, you know, mouse clicks about how they want to consume um, their favorite shows and movies and content. And I think eventually people that make content will feel compelled to go where the users are. So I'm optimistic overall about the future of, um, of content. It just realistically, it's going to take years to be completely resolved. And I, I know, obviously, you said your primary focus is on the consumer uh, boxy box right now. But uh, I know that at CES, we saw a demonstration of a television with boxy built in. And I guess, uh, and I forget which company it was, uh, pull, pulled the plug on doing that. Is it, Do you guys still uh, foresee boxy being built into televisions? Or is that something where your focus is just on the box right now and whatever else boxy becomes, it'll become? I, you know, we're a software company more than um, anything else at, at this point, but we do need hardware to run our software on because running our software just on PC as we, you know, um, you know, as we realized is just not enough because the, the friction with the consumers is too, is too big. So we do want to see our software running on as many devices as possible, uh, whether it's TVs or Blu-rays or standalone boxes. Um, we think all of them make sense. I don't think there's going to be one platform that uh, the twins it all. Um, at this case, where we control most of our destiny and where we have most control over the product is on the standalone box. Um, but I wouldn't rule out Boxy appearing on, on TVs. The deal that we had with, uh, with ViewSonic eventually didn't, uh, didn't go through. You know, for a bunch of reasons, uh, not necessarily having to do with the, with us, but you know, you you see that the the big TV makers are investing in um, in the smart TV um, opportunity. They're spending a lot of marketing dollars, product dollars. They're licensing content, so they're definitely making a push for it. And what we need to do on our side is, um, whenever these guys are ready to run our software on their device, that we'll be ready with um, with our best foot forward. So we'll, that's where we focus right now. So the uh, uh, the chat room, uh, you mentioned the three biggest challenges that you're facing right now. The chat room uh, is still running with that. They propose that number four is price, and, and but the, the fifth one is what surprised me the most. Uh, they brought up the factor of uh, bandwidth caps that a lot of regions are dealing with. Uh, do you see that that's something that could hinder online video to, to the point where it makes it a problem for Boxy, or is that something you feel like is going to work itself out in the next few years one way or the other? Yeah, so on, on the price issue, I, I agree with users. Boxy today is priced, the Boxy box is priced probably too high for most people's appetite. And I think if you know Boxy and research and you understand the value that it brings, you may be willing to shell out the extra dollars, but if you've never heard of Boxy and you're just looking to for something in the space, then it's going to be very hard to convince you to pay more than you'd pay for an Apple TV. I mean, we're, for many people, they don't know the brand. So um, having a price point of 179 is, is definitely a challenge that we need to deal with. Regarding uh, number five, bandwidth caps, I think it's definitely a risk. I would put it under the you know net neutrality um, banner. I think um, there is a risk that the companies that control the pipes, if they view behavior by consumers like streaming video as something that is cannibalistic for another business that they have, that they can use that power to hinder the way that video is being delivered. And I hope we don't get to that, to that point. Even CAPS, which I think is a legitimate business decision, is, is a challenge because that may just turn people off from watching TV or movies because they, when they watch a movie, they don't think in terms of bits and bytes. So that may be 
just making people afraid about watching video online, which I think is, is bad. And in an environment unlike Europe, in the US, you know, you have no alternatives. You can choose between Verizon and Comcast, but it's not that there is a wholesale market for that bandwidth and somebody, a third party, can go ride over that infrastructure and offer an uncapped offering. So I, I hope that it won't get to it, that it won't be uh, the reality that we have to live in. If it does, I think there's bigger companies that, that will have an issue with that. You know, Google, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, many others will suffer the consequences uh, far worse than us. So hopefully well, we can ride that's usually it. Down. The way I, I look at it is when people ask me, like, well, wait a minute, bandwidth caps are coming into place. I'm like, well, they're not there quite yet. They're not as at least as bad in the U.S. as they are in other places of the world. And there's some pretty entrenched, huge interests out there that have, have an interest in fighting this. So, uh, you know, it's going to be a clash of the titans, perhaps, or they may, they may work it out with, without it getting painful. But eventually, that kind of system just isn't going to work, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, as a, as a startup, we have to focus on the stuff that we can uh, control about our destiny more than anything else. So worrying about bandwidth caps, I mean, it, you know, we, we do follow it and, you know, we talk with people um, in DC if they pick up the phone and call us and ask questions. But um, it's not that we're going to invest in lobbying um, the Congress for, um, for laws. And I think we'll... We'll just hope that there's enough entrenched interests out there that uh, share the same philosophy as us so we can benefit from. Same goes for content. You know, nobody, ESPN is not going to decide tomorrow that they're going over the top a la carte just for boxing. And if we would be the only player in the space, there would be no chance of that happening. But with Apple, Google, Microsoft, you know, many others, um, accumulating subscribers over the top as a viable distribution model starts to become more and more appealing. So hopefully we can benefit from that overall trend. Do you think we'll see internet-only content ever get close to competing with, with this big network content like ESPN, like ABC, like CBS? Do you think we'll see like a YouTube or, or a Revision 3? And, and I'm not talking about Twitter. I'm not trying to be self-serving. We're a niche audience. But, but kind of these, you know, will you have a big network come in and say, you know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go over the top. We're not even going to mess with the cable industry. Because I, I kind of feel like that has to happen to give a push to people wanting to get these kind of boxes like the Logitech Review and the Apple TV and the Boxy? Yeah, I, I think the issue with most of the existing networks that you see on your cable guide is they owned by very few companies, so um, the interests are combined. Even if one channel, it may make sense for them to go over the top. Um, you know, they're owned by a company that has multiple channels, and overall the strategy doesn't make sense. I think where potentially you can see some some cracks in that wall is around um, specific talent like uh, Glenn Beck, whatever you think of his politics, sure. the, move, the move that he's made is potentially significant in the history of, um, of over the top as a viable alternative to, to cable. Um, and if you know, Colbert and John Stewart and others will follow suit, I think uh, it would start a real, a real wave. But for somebody like Glenn Beck, you know, it, it wasn't an altruistic decision. I think he made, you know, a, a cold calculation about the potential benefit that he has Keep and the economics. Yeah, yeah Definitely. the economics just made sense. And I think they make sense for for many people and, and shows out there. So I think there's going to be an opportunity there for more, you know, obviously more niche content. It's not Super Bowl or NFL that are going over the top. But I, I think you'll see more of those type of shows um, going with the internet as a primary distribution method. And I think we're really still at the early stages of taking advantage of the internet. It's not just about putting a show, you know, once a week or, or once a day. There's more things that you can do in the platform like you guys are doing in terms of, you know, chatting at the same time and creating more um, experiences that take advantage of the distribution platform that I think eventually, if that's going to take off, that's going to drive more and more creators of content to, to do stuff online. Abner, thanks so much uh, for, for chatting with us. We're going to get to the rest of our news here. You're welcome to, to hang out and, and, and chat with us the rest of the show uh, if you want.
Yeah, I, I have many opinions on many subjects that don't relate to uh, to boxing. So as long as I'm not too offensive, I'll be happy to share my thoughts. No, we need we need opinions, and that the more conflicting, the better. Let's move on to another big story. Stop everything! It's another big story. By the way, it is a great episode of Frame Rate when this is our another big story because I thought this was huge. Yeah, uh, no kidding. Amazon announces the new Kindle tablet, the Amazon Kindle Fire, uh, which will come for $199 November 15th, be a color Android gingerbread-based tablet allowing you to play Amazon videos, read Amazon eBooks, uh, and comes with 30 days free Amazon Prime membership, which not only gives you the free shipping from Amazon, but also gives you access to their Amazon Instant Streaming, which is sort of their Netflix uh, competitor. I think Amazon did exactly the right thing. They said, we're not taking on the iPad. Right. We're taking on an area that the iPad doesn't serve. It's cheaper. It's a little more reduced. It's not productivity oriented. You can't do everything with right. the Kindle Fire, but you can do certain things it looks like very well. Of course, we have to get our hands on the hardware, but it is made by Quanta, so it's the same hardware roughly that was in the BlackBerry playbook. And the knock on the playbook was never the hardware. The hardware was always good with the playbook. It was the implementation of the software, particularly the apps there. Right. Now, from the beginning, from the beginning of the Kindle experiment, Amazon has consistently been very clear in their focus. They want the device to do one thing and do it exceptionally well. The Kindle was supposed to replace your paperback or hard, your hardcover books. And they kept knocking down the price to where finally they got it down below. That just as significant as the announcement that now it's only $79 for the Kindle. Uh, they got in that magic under $100 price point. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the, the fire, there was no way there was, they were going to do it for $99 without taking on major losses. Uh, although I do predict, I think within a year or so, we're going to see a $99 version of the fire. Uh, but uh, also, by positioning this not as a competitor to the iPad, but instead to say, this is a continuation of the exact same philosophy you had with the Kindle. It's going to do one thing, play media exceptionally well and at a good price. Uh, and and I, I think it could do it. I, I, I got to imagine once the video starts playing, it's not going to stutter or jitter around or whatever, in which case the, the end user experience will be for, the, for my parents-in-law, they will buy this and feel like they pretty much got everything they would get out of an iPad with it. Wi-Fi only is good enough for them? Oh, sure. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Most people will watch this, you know, use this around the house. After, what's your take on the fire? Uh, we ordered two at the office. Um, <laughs> so you liked it? And, and, you know, I have I have an iPad and a Kindle, um, and I I agree. I think there is you know there is an issue. I like the fact that they didn't try and go head to head with um, with an exact same product, but you know innovated on on the scope of the product, which I think makes it much easier um, sell to to an obvious user. So I don't think they'll be taking away from potential iPad buyers um, too much. I think it's a new, it's a new category probably, and you know, can't wait to get my hands on it and see if it um, lives up to to the demo because it looks very promising. Now, the the amazing thing to me is that they're bundling it with the Amazon Prime. You get 30 days of Amazon Prime, which is which is weird because Amazon Prime has always been a pay once, get it for a year type thing. Uh, have they have they done trials for 30 days before with Amazon Prime? I'm not, I don't know that they haven't. Right. There's been any kind of special introductory thing. Uh, well, this certainly stu st stuck out to me because uh, not only, uh, first of all, Man, I can't believe I would have discounted Amazon so hardcore just two months ago. But seeing this utter flip-flop reversal of, of Netflix stumbling and Amazon just doubling down on their, on their whole Amazon Prime, uh, I think they've nailed it because Amazon Prime is almost a perfect – perfectly good deal at $79 just for the free shipping. But now that they're just that they're just hammering with so much content and that you can consume it instantly on the uh, on on the fire, I I got to I mean uh, uh, Amazon Prime is no longer the RC in the in the Coke versus Pepsi debate here. I think uh, I think they're President's second choice. place. <laughs> yes, exactly. They're Sam's choice cola. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, this has been a real coup for them to, to leap forward like this. You know, uh, Seth Meyers on Saturday Night Live cracked the joke that this will sell very well amongst parents who always get the wrong thing. Yes, well, and, and I'm sure there will be <laughs> petulant teenagers who feel that way. But meanwhile, that's, that's not who they're marketing to. That's not what they're trying to do. They're, they're very clear that they're not trying to be an iPad. What they're trying to do is offer a, uh, an extension of the exact same thing they've been doing with the Kindle. All right, let's move on to Film Foul.
Just a couple things in Film Film uh, this week. First of all, Sony has said they're going to stop paying for movie theater 3D glasses. I guess they've been subsidizing this for Sony 3D Pictures. They're saying, look, we'll, we'll pay for the glasses. Uh, the theater owners, of course, always pushed to the edge of cost margins are firing back saying, well, fine, then we're not going to run your 3D pictures. Uh, but so far, uh, Sony isn't budging. Well, uh, now, I don't know what your experience has been at the theater, but uh, I don't know how much waste there is in this. I would imagine a lot of people just take the 3D glasses home with them, and then it, they don't bring them back to the theater. They just have them laying around at home because, I don't know, they're free. And it's smart in that something that's free has no value. People treat it like it's free, like it's water, uh, and that's got to be very cost prohibitive for Sony. On the flip side, uh, this is way early for them to be crying about about the expense of the, of the glasses. I got to think this is going to be a major blow to 3D. Now, the, the consumer probably will not even notice they, they won't even know how this this um, this pissing contest goes down between the uh, the theater owners and Sony but the, the I think there will be a change I think there's a lot of theaters that are going to stop showing 3D altogether and I don't know I don't know what this means for the future of 3D in general I, yeah, 3D seems pretty shaky Abner are you a fan of 3D movies or do you prefer to just watch the old fashioned 2D um you know, I didn't watch too much 3D um, movies. I actually went to watch um, a 4D movie in uh, the Central Spy Park Kids? Zoo. Um, Central Park Zoo, they, oh. you know, they spread water on us. Um, <laughs> that was nice. But I think, I, I think 3D is actually, you know, it's worked, ni worked out nice for, um, for theaters as a, as a differentiating, you know, value proposition. Um, I think the judgment is still out. Uh, you know, right now, 3D at theaters work, I think, for many people. At home, more more challenging. And I, I think for Sony to back out from um, subsidizing it, I, you know, I, I don't know the, co the costs that are associated and whether they think they have leverage or not. So I, I don't know whether it means that anything, whether we need to read anything uh, significant into it. I, I would love for them to sponsor popcorn at the theaters, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly, right? Yeah, right. Well, and uh, now what do you think about this? Do you think it's possible that they'll try to do a deposit model where you go in the theater and the glasses are free as long as you make sure to drop them off their way out? And or so the, the airline owns. model, actually, I think would work better. We'll sell you a pair of glasses for $2. Oh, you don't you can have always one? bring them back yeah. and use them. Uh, and we won't charge you anything. Yeah, and I don't know that that's going to be a deal breaker. I think that uh, I, 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 as much as I'm not a fan of what Sony's doing, I think they're making the right call for where they are right now. I think that would just be a pain, though, if I it had will. To, when I, I come in, I show them my ticket. They're like, oh, and if you want 3D glasses, it's another $2. I, Even look, if it is just the first time, it's just like well, and, and you got to make that. This is why it's, this is why it's smart for Sony because you're not going to blame Sony at that moment. No, you're going to blame, gonna the, blame theater. the theater, right? Yeah, exactly. Our other film film story is about watching movies on your Apple TV over the weekend, probably because Apple was tweaking their their new cloud service, iCloud, that's coming soon. <laughs> you're busy saying backsies on their errant emails. Yeah, uh, un, uh, a bunch of people lost the ability to play their movies that they had purchased through the Apple TV. Now, the reason this would happen is because Unlike the old Apple TV, you don't actually download the movie to your hard drive with the new Apple TV. You, you stream it, essentially. Right. Uh, and it checks your digital right man rights management when you do that. The DRM servers were down, and here we go. Here's where DRM rears its ugly head. When it works, you never notice it if right. you're following the rules. When it doesn't work, it breaks everything. And so you paid for something. You were legal. You were trying to do it right. And you get punished. Well, I was going to make some kind of joke about, like, surely this is the first time it's ever happened. But then, like, just even thinking about the long list, everything from, like, uh, Windows Play for Sure files suddenly being totally useless. It's so easy for these companies early on to assure you of how quick and dirty, how totally easy and transparent their, DL, uh, their, you know, their, their uh, DRM is. And it's hard in the long term to keep the servers on and keep everything running. And it doesn't surprise me that there's going to be hiccups like this. And even worse... Times where they just full on pull the plugs and like, sorry, we're not a company anymore. You can't watch any of that stuff. After I'm sure you, I know you've tussled with the intricacies of DRM implementation with with services uh, before. Is there any hope that we would ever lose DRM on video the way we have lost it on audio? Uh, there's hope, but it's slim hope. <laughs> uh, I, today, I think it's um, it's a necessity. There's just no way that you can get premium content without uh, DRM, and I think it's going to take years, if not forever, for studios to back down from it. The, you know, the said, 
piece about it is that today it's kind of a penalty you pay for doing the right thing. You know, if you're if you're paying for a movie and you buy it on Amazon or Apple, you may come across these type of issues or blackout windows. You know, if you go and, and torrent and it torrent it, you know, you're fine. And I think every time stuff like that happens, um, people get upset and for the right reason because they you know they made the decision to purchase and, and pay rather than than pirate and they're being punished for it so uh, i think today it's a very sensitive um time as you try to educate consumers that you know really there is an alternative to um to piracy and it's affordable and it's easy to use and it's available to you immediately and stuff like that just takes the industry backwards so i really hope you know i understand the need for drm i really hope that they find a way to make it um less painful on, on the consumer, but I really hope that they can get to a place where it's like um, like with music. I mean, I, I don't think the RM on, on streaming videos have prevented any type of piracy. No, I, well, I, that's the bitter yeah. irony of it, of course. You know, it's this feel-good thing that they all want to do, but you're right in that it all does is punish the people who are doing the right thing. But I got to imagine that there'll come a time when bandwidth gets large enough and when it becomes so easy to stream any video content, once we get all these negotiations hammered out between all the different content providers, at some point with audio, it just felt silly to have DRM anymore. And, and it took one of the big players like Apple and, and well, Amazon. Steve Jobs wrote that letter. That uh, says remember, now you that kids. said we really don't want to have DRM anymore, but we have to. Right. And then convinced the uh, the music companies to drop the DRM with iTunes Plus, kind of a half measure, and then got it dropped altogether. Uh, does it does it take a big company like Apple or maybe an Amazon or a Google? to push the industry. I, I think we do. I think, I think what we saw with audio is exactly what we'll see with video again. Now, it's going to be on a longer time schedule because we're talking about orders of magnitude larger files, and so the bandwidth will have to accelerate to a, a level where it becomes, you know, minuscule. Like, the way audio feels to us now as a percentage of our total bandwidth, video needs to feel about the same amount, and we've we got a long way until that's going to happen. A hundred percent agree. Yeah. Let's move on to Tube Tops. Just announced today, Yahoo teaming up with ABC News on original video for the web, ba right. news video. Uh, the first big one was today, an interview with some guy, oh, the President of the United States. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I mean, starting small, working their way up. Well, it's good that they're not trying to overstep their reach at the first place. Yeah, uh, but, but no, kind of, kind of huge news. They're almost merging the newsrooms, not quite, but ABC News and Yahoo working very closely. In my imagination, I just want to assume that uh, your friend of mine, Becky Worley, did all this by herself. Well, you know she works for both. Well, right? I know. That's yeah. exactly right. So I've decided She's that the embodiment. Becky did all this. Good job. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, Hulu now allowing you to swap your ads. You can't skip it necessarily, but if you don't like the ad, uh, Hulu now has an ad swap product which launched today uh, to kick off advertising week in now, New York giving users the ability to have a different ad play. This sounds I don't like silly. this ad. Play me a different ad. This sounds silly but I love this because there it, it at least it, it, number one, it, it absolutely, by definition, will enhance the user's experience. You will get, you still have to watch the ads, but they will be for either products that you care more about or ads of a style like, oh, just give me a funny cat ad for insurance. That will be great. Well, I can see my, myself using it when it's that ad that you've seen a million times. You're like, ah, oh, I'm so sick of this right. ad running. Skip. Give me something different. Give right. me something new, at least. And, and also, the advertisers win because they understand, they learn which of their ads are so annoying that people turn them off instantly or which the, don't even make an impression. I mean, this is, again, we've said this time and time again, the advertising opportunities on the web are so much better than what are even possible with traditional television that it's, it's a mystery to me why they aren't paying three, four, five times as much for the qualified leads that you get on television that you're not, or qualified leads on Hulu that you're not able to get over traditional television. I Ab think everybody wins with this. Abner, is this something you would use? Do you think it's good for the industry? Uh, I think so. I, you know, Hulu did a great job a couple of years, I think it was a couple of years back with Ad Selector. They were, you know, the first major um, video provider to enable users to choose before the ad starts to play which ads they want to choose. And I think that comes from the same logic that if you get the user even just a bit more choice, a tiny more choice, 
his engagement level is significantly higher and his satisfaction is higher and his recollection of the ads is higher. So I, I think it's a, it's a win for everyone. And the more the Tulu and the likes can show that they can demonstrate value by advertising on online video, you know, the easier it makes it for uh, broadcasters and premium content owners to put their content online. And you know, it needs to get to the point where you know, it's people are going to be the people that, you know, are selling those ads are going to be, you know, agnostic of whether somebody watched their show on TV or on PC or through Hulu or through cable. And the only way to do that is to provide a better ad product. Yeah, although it does make you watch more of more ad time. Because you have to watch a little bit of the bad ad. To decide you hate you skip, it and go watch it. You still have to watch the full good ad. Yeah. You? Although, I'll tell you, man, like uh, the best ad experience I ever had on Hulu was, was when it, before the show even started, said, hey, you can watch a two minute video all about the new Halo oh, game, yeah, yeah. or you can watch regular ads. I was like, dude, put well, especially sign me when up. it's something like the Halo game. Well, just like, something you care I would about. like to see that. Well, and especially right? and that makes because, all the difference. Exactly. And those ads were, they were really slickly shot. They looked like Battlestar Galactica, little yeah. vignettes. I mean, they, you know, uh, advertising is in many ways becoming its own short form of. Uh, uh, arts, you know, whether there's comedy, well, it's whether it's been that way for a while, but it's it's supercharged and super obvious now. Right. I think, yeah, right, absolutely. Mipcom going on in Cannes, France. Uh, it's a place where the internet has started to show up. We see Facebook there, we see Netflix showing up there, but it's it's usually a place where everyone sort of tries to buy the content that you see on television and sometimes in movies as well. Uh, Netflix's Ted Serendos, he is the chief operating officer and sort of the guy in charge of the content on Netflix was speaking at MIPCOM and said 50% and sometimes 60% of viewing on Netflix is TV episodes now, not uh, films. Now, from a branding perspective, this obviously was a big shocker because you associate, you think Netflix is movies and Hulu is TV and right. the Twain Show meet. However, uh, especially, for example, I believe Breaking Bad is the entire back catalog of Breaking Bad now on Netflix. Yeah, and nothing from this current season. Wow, so you, do, yeah, you can yeah. experience all of break, Breaking Bad. Uh, now, if you think about it as far as a viewership time, you once you get invested in a series, and you and I'll, I think nowadays we see a lot more people experiencing an entire run of shows sitting down for weeks at a time. You're watching every single night. You're going to complete the entire back catalog, five, four seasons or three seasons of Breaking Bad to get caught up. So there's so many more hours of content. It's kind of not surprising that at any given time you'd have a higher percentage of people watching television on there. In a way, it's surprising. In a way, it's kind of what you'd expect uh, if you're a Netflix user, don't you think, Abner? Yeah, I think, you know, for a long time, Netflix didn't get enough credit for being a destination for people to watch TV. And I think they have an amazing product on that on that front. And now they just, I guess, want the recognition that they deserve. Um, I don't think that they see themselves as, as a movies only brand. And the experience around TV shows in Netflix is um, is amazing because, you know, as as you mentioned, you can you know, spend nights just watching free episodes every night and go through through a season. And I think that really is a behavior that we see also with our users is that they don't want to wait a week between episodes. They're fine with just waiting for the whole season to end or for the whole TV series to end and wait for somebody to make their recommendation. Then they'll sit and watch it in bulk, go through uh, lonely weekends with ice cream and Netflix. And, <laughs> well, well, and I'll yeah, tell you, man, I'm shocked at what a difference of quality you get from a television show when you watch them all straight through. I gave up on Lost twice, fully gave up, and it was, I watched it at first, I missed the first season, watched it straight through, loved it, started the second season, and I, I assume now it was because that I couldn't handle the week, wait. Wait, the week to week. I yeah. was like, well, it's no good anymore, and I was done with it. And then once, you know, then third season rolled around, I was like, well, let me go back and watch the second. Got back in and then hated it again after the third season. Right. Well, Netflix uh, has an exclusive deal for content. Uh, David Fincher's House of Cards, we've talked about that. At MIPCON, they announced a second deal. This is uh, for a series called Lilyhammer, starring Stephen Van Zandt. So, they're, you know, they, they, they kind of play, they like, oh, no, this is just an experiment for us. It's just a way to beef up the catalog. But, but meanwhile, in their secret steps. folders yeah. in the back rooms, they've got plans to take over the world. Uh, real quick note here, Showtime has launched their Anytime streaming portal uh, and their iPad app. So uh, essentially, it's not quite an HBO Go. Uh, it's more of a companion piece to Showtime. But, uh, but they're getting into this idea of being able to, you know, watch 
a past episodes of Dexter on your iPad. Yeah. Well, and again, it's like uh, even if it is a Me Too project, product, at least it's one more company saying Me Too to getting us what we want when we want it. Now, uh, Star Trek: The Next Generation uh, coming out on Blu-ray. I excited. Not I excited. Actually am. Star Trek fan. Yeah. I mean, what's funny is I will never buy it on Blu-ray, but in five years, when you're able to stream Blu-ray content over Netflix, I look forward to seeing them in high def. And this it's is going to be a sampler. They're not putting out all the episodes right at first. Well, and and I hope that they do make enough money on this to go back and do the whole thing because they're trying something different. Because the episodes were shot on film, but then post. Post effects were done in uh, digital, or I guess uh, I, don't, I don't know what. Yeah, what they did they... this with the original series. They went back and they redid the effects in digital, uh, where they could where they could actually recomposite the effects, and right. then left everything that was shot on that you couldn't redo digitally, like actors appearing on screen, right. and left and just kind of remastered and touched that up. You know, it's funny what uh, how this brings to light the fact that film has always provided such a consistently high grade experience for so very long and it, it really blew my mind when HDNet came out one of the things that I always caught whenever I flipped by the channel was Knight Rider on I'm like how on earth is Knight Rider in in HD and none of these current shows are and of course you know it's because Knight Rider was shot on film and they're able to upsample yeah, it very exactly. easily and apparently someone in the chat rooms uh, pointed out that TNG was transferred from film to video and edited on video and so this this is taking it straight from the film wow so they'll actually have to take all the film masters then do cut for cut yeah, remakes yeah, exactly. so, so considerably more effort are you a Star Trek fan, Amber? Yeah, I mean, going way way back, but uh, yeah, watch through. You know, Captain Picard, I guess, was uh, was, next was my girl for a long time. Uh, that, that you'll get uh, one bad episode and two good ones on the first sampler <laughs> disc. Encounter at Farpoint, which they kind of have to do. It's the first oh, episode. Oh, sure, of course. Then the Inner Light and Sins of the Father, which which are both great episodes. Finally, uh, Arrested Development. Coming back to television and movies. Yes, this is like we've heard we've heard dueling rumors for the longest time. Oh, they'll come back and do another season. Oh, it's going to be a movie instead. And to get a confirmation now, of course, there there have been plenty of times when people have full on announced that something's going to happen, and then it still doesn't, it doesn't happen. Yeah. We already had our hearts broken with the whole Dark Tower fiasco, uh, and this could be happening again. But I'll tell you what, the entire internet smiled the day that this posted. It was amazing. Uh, creator Mitchell Hurwitz, speaking at a reunion of the cast and at a New York festival, uh, said the spinoff will feature nine or ten episodes focusing on each character, and then leading up to the movie, the first scene of the movie will be all the characters reunited. Uh, the idea being on these nine episodes, episodes, it, it's easier to shoot. Right. Because uh, everybody's people. gone on to become super famous in their exactly. own endeavors. Yeah. If, you, if you just focus on one character uh, in each episode, um, we'll, we'll see if this actually makes it Finger to the screen. But oh, I, please. It has I to. Really it has it to. It's written in the internet. Uh, we got a ton of people submitting what we're watching. <laughs> That, uh, uh, I've, I've <laughs> we, have to have, we have to have our own beauty pageant to decide really which are. is the best one. Or we could just keep rotating. I like that, too. We could just rotate through and then see which one we like better. What, which one do we got today, Chad? Uh, from Gatoway. Gatoway, yeah. All right, let's take a look. It's time for What We're Watching. And uh, Brian... I like the way it ends up. I'm not sure about the weird. Yeah. Well, it's, it's very zen at that yeah. moment. Yeah. This is kind of re repurposing. Uh, I'll, I'll start us off. Uh, and uh, Avner, I'll give you fair warning. You could say you're not watching anything. Uh, if you don't want to admit what you're watching, we'll get to you last. <laughs> uh, I saw Drive this weekend, the movie, with uh, Walt from Breaking Bad and the guy from The Notebook. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How was it? Uh, it was really good. What did I, I liked it. Now, a few people on Twitter think I'm crazy. They're like, that was the worst movie I've ever seen. Really? I liked it because it was a very twisty movie. I never knew where it was going next. It surprised me a lot. It is the movie where you have to do a lot of the thinking. Right. There's a lot of pauses. There's a lot of, like, you fill in the blanks. You kind of have to think along with the movie. And if you're looking at a movie called Drive, and right. you think this is going to be about car races, yeah, and you adrenaline. show up for a good action movie, and you sit back, and they're like, no, you're going to have to think. Right. You're going to be disappointed. But, yeah, I thought, it, I thought it surprised me. It was not cliche. It was really interesting characters. And, of course, Brian Cranston well, and did a fantastic that's job. That's what I wanted to Didn't ask. Didn't look at all like Walter Well, And that's what I wanted to ask. Brian Cranston has phenomenal range. Uh, he is so incredibly funny, but yet plays the exact play so awkwardly unfunny in uh, in Breaking Bad. What what flavor of Brian Cranston do you have? This is Brian Cranston with a limp. 
uh, and, a, and a beard and hair. Okay. Uh, and, but it's a sh- much shorter beard. It's more just like a scruffy beard, not the big beard that Walt has. I, I don't know what you're and talking he's, about. he's not doing the, uh, the Walter White shifty eye thing. Right. He is, he's, a, he's actually kind of a semi-competent uh, uh, guy who runs a shop that fixes cars. Okay. But he's a little bit of a weasel. I like that. Yeah. He's not, he's not the smart guy like Walter White. He's kind of a dumb guy. So go, uh, well, lately, Walter White's been acting oh, yeah, like the exactly. dumb guy. <laughs> Breaking Bad. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about Breaking okay. Bad, I have a feeling, uh, when we talk about what you're watching. Doctor Who finale was on Saturday. Absolutely loved it. Uh, okay. Stephen Moffat, genius. I, I had a great time. And all it did was make me just hunger for the next season to begin. Because he resolved this season's o- opening in a way... That wasn't perfectly satisfactory, but at least I was, I was, I could accept it. Right. And then just splattered you with teases and mysteries for next year. So when we went to Dragon Con, I was shocked at how many Doctor Whos and Doctor Who references there were. Uh, and there, it was almost as though Doctor Who was the slave Leia of the, uh, of the cosplay world. Is, has, has Doctor Who made the transition to being truly mainstream, do you think? I think it's almost there. Abner, do you watch Doctor Who? Uh, unfortunately, no. Okay, so no, it hasn't made it <laughs> <laughs> until <laughs> after it's watched stage. it. It doesn't no. count for nothing. I, I think I think it's really close. You what? know, I think it's it's up in that level of like sci-fi network hit. Right. Uh, you know, it's it's equal to it to a great hit on sci-fi. I don't know if it's quite Battlestar Galactica level or not. It's right. it's getting close. It's definitely not breakout hit. I don't know if it's mainstream enough. Well, and Part of the problem is it's on BBC America, which a lot of people don't get. Well, yes. And, and uh, to me, the worry is, and this is the weird, like, selfish fan thinking that I have. It's like, when there's something I love, I want it to get popular, but not so popular that a guy I don't know would make fun of it. You know? Like, yeah. something like, oh, I hate that. Uh, they play that all the time Dr. on the radio. what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, real quickly, just, uh, just quick reviews of new shows. I'm souring on person of interest. Uh, if you really like Ben from Lost, Mm -hmm. you probably still enjoy it, but that's Michael Emerson is carrying that show right now. Ringer uh, with Sarah Michelle Gellar. It, it, it exceeds my expectations. Yeah, you Granted, said that last those were time. very low, but it, it's still doing good. And New Girl with Zoe Deschanel. Uh, what, Surprisingly it, funny. See, okay, now, now, is this the first you've finally watched it? Second, I watched both episodes. Yeah. My wife loves it. Like, she, she it's, thinks it's great. And, I was laughing. And, uh, well, and uh, is, does Zoe Deschanel play anything but the one character? No, but it's a good character. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's a, that's yeah. Her and Kevin Costner. Uh, and then cool. quick notes, Warehouse 13 finale tonight on Sci-Fi, and uh, Sanctuary premieres on Friday, taking over from Haven, which, by the way, had a fantastic finale as well. I, you know, I, I don't need to say it again. Love yes. Haven. So uh, what I wish I was watching this week, and I didn't, unfortunately, I deactivated my HBO so because I only bought it just so I could watch Game of Thrones, but I think I'm going to have to go back and pick it back up, especially if the Time Warner app works with uh, HBO Go is uh, Boardwalk Empire. I'm excited about Haven't seen it yet, but, of course, Breaking Bad next two season finale. Uh, it's, it's really coming to a head. The penultimate episode. The penultimate Easter. episode, yeah. indeed. Uh, what did you think? I just am constantly thrilled with this show because it just every, it's like watching a chapter uh, of a book every time. It's not, I can't think of it as seasons. I think of it as one continuous story that just gets interrupted by a week or several months, depending. Right. Yeah. Well, and where we are now is so unfathomably far from where we started with the show. And yet, uh, as we've, we've discussed over and over and over again, the, the, what, the core of the show is still identical. The characters obviously have changed over time. And, and real, really, the problems of the show are completely identical, yeah, just yeah. with the different no uh, trappings. Yeah. All right, a- Avner, uh, any of those shows we talked about you want to comment on or any shows you're watching you want to throw in there? I'm actually now not watching any shows. Um, watch the Game of Thrones. Um, actually, I'm kind of watching Weeds. I guess. Um, is that but, is that new, or are you watching back episodes? No, no, no. I'm watching the the latest. Okay. Uh, is it yeah. is it worth it? Because I sort of fell off after last season. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard for me uh, to give up on uh, Mary Louise Parker, so I'm. <laughs> I'm loyal, loyal in that way. It doesn't matter what she does. Um, yeah, but it's yeah, it's getting tough. And what else? I watched The Reef. It's an Australian movie okay. about you know. I won't give it away, but the sharks eat it, everybody. <laughs> in case you're wondering how it went, but you don't know in what order. <laughs> That's so true. It's still worth right. watching. Exactly. Yeah. 
<laughs> exactly. All right, it's excellent. It's a true story, by the way. Thanks. All right, let's move on to Interferon. Our web video series section, Warner Brothers, to premiere a social series on Facebook called Aim High. It'll premiere October 18th, according to the studio. Consumers can become part of the show by adding their profile information, photos, text from friends, etc., etc. Uh, and then you watch the comedy. It's an action comedy, Aim High, in a personalized viewing mode. So it's, it's not only a series being made for the web, but it's trying to weave in that gimmick of, you know, the video that shows your name and the headline of the newspaper. I am so... Th th this, I'm, this seems so dubious to me. I, this has such a spectacular opportunity to fail. I could see him like, oh, I'm just going to go home and watch my favorite movie, The Big Lebowski. <laughs> and they're like, that's just my have them favorite turn, movie. You know, turn away from the camera a little bit. <laughs> right. Uh, I, it'll take, um, this is ambitious, and it'll either look really, really silly or trite. Uh, or, you know, if you get the right director, somebody who uh, sees uh, a way to marry this, uh, which again... Well, some of those videos where you can insert people's pictures and names work yes, really as, well, as, surprisingly as, well. As gimmicks. And, yeah. they, and they, you know, they, they, they make you laugh at the end, or they scare you, or they surprise you. Uh, so they can do the surprise, but, but to try to tell a real story... True Blood did this uh, for, as one of their webisodes, and I thought they did it quite well in a way where, you know, you're, you're, you were just sort of incidentally in the scene. You weren't critical to the scene, so it wasn't as laughable. Right. Well, I don't know. Maybe, but then again, if it's an action comedy, then maybe it'll be all right. That, that's the. Uh... And uh, one show comes, another one leaves. Kevin Rose and Alex Albrecht are once again canceling Big Nation. I know, and right? this time they mean it. <laughs> you know what? I guess the announcement is that they've renewed their first fourth season of canceling Dignation. <laughs> yes. This, this time, Dignation is scheduled to end in December. Uh, and, of course, Alex Albrecht will continue uh, to, to host Totally Rad Show. Kevin Rose will host Foundation. Uh, but that will be the end of the long running since uh, July 2005 Dignation. I'm not going to lie. Uh, all I thought of as soon as I read this story, and people, you know, full disclosure, we both also have shows over at Revision 3 Network. Uh, so people might think we have some kind of insight. I got no insight. The only thing I know for sure is... I was like, well, I wonder who, what they're going to do with South by Southwest, because that's the big party yeah, of the right. year, is that exactly. Stubbs Barbecue. They could still do a, dig a special reunion Oh, yeah, you, you know, they could. They could do something. a reunion yeah. dignation, or they could make it a whole Revision 3 variety show where everyone yeah, comes out and does right. 20 minutes. I don't know that it'll quite have the pull. They'd have to market pretty hard to get the audiences that they were getting for dignation, though. Do you, think, do you believe them this time, Abner, that they're really going to cancel dignation? Um, yeah, I find it hard to believe about South by that it will be a South by without the Dignation party. But um, yeah, otherwise, I, I you know I guess you know five six years you know it's legitimate for them to end it. You no, know? they don't have to grow old and die with that show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, let's finish up with some feedback. Now it's Ambush. time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Frame Radio. Yeah. First email comes from somebody who didn't put their name at the end of the email, and then I forgot to cut and paste their name from the actual what an email address. awkwardly long name this person has. Uh, hello, Tom and Brian. I have heard you talk a lot about Doctor Who and how much you guys love it. For someone who has never seen an episode, where would you suggest I begin 783 episodes to date? Should I just start with the 2005 relaunch and only watch the first 26 seasons when I am up to date? Any help would be appreciated. Uh, can I tell you, this is my big problem because I started rewatching. of course, I I watched a whole bunch as a kid. I had fond memories of that was my dad's show, and I was always hanging out with dad watching Tom Baker. And I loved the reboot, watched the whole first season of that. But then um, uh, Avner's had it. He's like, I'm out of here. He's like, I'm not More Doctor, Doctor Who talk. Who. What kind of show is this? Uh, but then uh, I fell off after mid season uh, on one of those back with Christopher Eccleston, and I didn't want to start a season without being all caught back up. So as a result, I'm now like three, four years behind. Oh, yeah, my advice here if you're starting off, uh, from fresh, start with the 2005 season with Christopher Eccleston uh, and watch it in order up until you catch up to the current season. However, I would sprinkle in you know, as you're watching, Just for first time you meet the Daleks, 
go watch a couple of the old Daleks episodes. Maybe watch the first one where the Daleks appear. Watch the Tom Baker Dalek episode where you find out the origin of the now, Daleks. Now, where would we get the all these? Cybermen show up. You can get some of them on Netflix. Uh, you can definitely get the DVDs of right. all of these on Netflix. Uh, but some of them are even streaming. And I, that's how I would do it. It was just like when something strikes your interest, like I wonder what the backstory is. Go dig that up. And, but don't feel like you have it to really watch is, the man. entire run of the previous Doctor, Doctor Who something. is like an archaeological dig, where it's just it's too much to, to possibly process, it's certainly not linearly. I mean, you'd, you'd have to suffer through yeah. so many seasons of ancient, outdated effects just to get caught up with the, uh, with the current stuff. What would be excellent is if you could actually have somebody, and I, I, maybe I, I don't think I'm the right person to do this, but maybe somebody in the chat room could, uh, somebody come up with like, okay, here are the, here's the one or two shows you need to watch before this episode. So right. that when you do see the Daleks for the first time in the re reboot, right. you've seen, you kind of know where they're coming the, from. The curated experience, uh, exactly what you and I did with uh, the Dark Tower series. Yeah. Like, watch this, read this, that kind of thing. We're trying to get Avner back on the line. I'll go ahead and read this letter from Simon. Hi, guys. On the latest frame rate, you brought up the topic of movies and TV shows that you own being hosted in the cloud. Not so long ago, we were talking about the changes that George Lucas made to Star Wars for the Blu-ray release. If the entertainment industry moves to a point where it's common to buy media in a cloud stored form are you worried that media producers may then re-edit the hosted copies of movies or tv shows that you already know when you have your own copy physical or digital then you can always re-watch that version if uh, if you only have hosted digital copies then you might go to watch star wars one day and find that luke skywalker has now been replaced with jar jar that would be awesome <laughs> <laughs> i'm guessing that the cloud hosted purchases become available somewhere in the fine print will be a clause saying that you don't own anything and you're just licensing the right to watch whatever's being made of available. I'm concerned that at some point this may become the only option regards Simon. Uh, this is a great observation. I fully believe this. I fully think this is going to happen. And our, the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, has all these provisions that make actual criminals out of people who would hoard the original versions and distribute them underground. Where we are entering a digital age where this is not, this is not uh, overstating it, we would make criminals out of artists to try to preserve the original artistic yeah, expression. Yeah, but you know what? Fighting piracy has not proved to be very profitable for the industry, and I think they're slow, that's starting to slowly sink in. And what would happen here is that all you would do would be create a pirate market for those original versions. So if the studios are smart, right. they'll say, well, we may be able to play and do all of this stuff that he's talking about as a, as a benefit, but we should always make those uncut versions available, you know, at a, at a reasonable cost, and they'd end up making more money that way because people are like, oh, right. now I want to see the director's cut. Now I want to see the extra director's cut. I mean, look at how many versions of Blade Runner there are out there or yes. versions of Dune. Uh, I think that might end up being the model where you pay a little extra for those special unedited versions. Right. In the future, Avner Ronan, uh, glad we got you back right at the end of the show. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us today. I appreciate sure, it. Sure, thanks for having me. Uh, and let folks know uh, where they can find more information about Boxy. Uh, just go to boxy.tv or Boxy on Google or on uh, DuckDuckGo. All right. And that's B O X E E. That's right, B O X E E. Thanks, everybody, for watching and listening. And we will see you next time on Frame Rate, twit.tv slash FR. See you later. Bye.